Good evening. Welcome to the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Special Program Series. Tonight, it is our pleasure to present the panel, New Directions in Menswear. The panel will feature three brands led by FIT alumni and will be moderated by our colleague and friend, Alex Joseph. Alex is the managing editor of Hue, the magazine of the Fashion Institute of Technology. He also is an independent author who has contributed to Vestoy, Fashion Studies Journal, Surface, and Fashion Theory. Please join me in welcoming Alex. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Great to see you all. Um, I wanted to make sure that everybody who wanted a copy of Hugh got one. If you didn't, they're up at the top. Um, this evening is all about menswear, and as Tanya explained, um, we have designers from three incredibly hot menswear brands, all of whom happen to be FIT grads. They all appear in the magazine, and they were photographed by Christopher Hall for the magazine. Christopher Hall also is an alum. Um, he was a group project that's worked on by a number of people, but Linda Ann Grilly and Jonathan Vatner, who are both in the audience, helped me a lot with the magazine, and Jonathan organized this shoot. He did a lot of work there, so I really appreciate that. Um, and I'd just like to also thank the museum at FIT and point out to you that if you go over there to see the really awesome Black Fashion Designers show, you'll get to see um, this wonderful ensemble by Willie Smith of Willie Wear and um, this, this cool suit by Jeffrey Banks, among many other great pieces in that cool show. So uh, here's how the evening is going to go. We're going to do the whole thing in an hour, so things are going to move fast. I'm going to introduce uh, each brand, the designers for each brand. Um, we'll have a little bit of chit chat, just me and that designer. Uh, then the group of us will sit and talk about menswear issues generally. And then finally, there will be about 15 or 20 minutes at the end for you in the audience to ask questions. So if you have a question, write it down and we will be passing around microphones and you'll be able to ask any questions you have at that time. Okay, great. Um, we're going to start with Abbasi Rospero. Uh, Abdul Abbasi and Greg Rospero started their namesake concern, Abbasi Rospero, four years ago, fusing military sports style with business casual. They were inspired in part by uh, Rospero's observation of a flight attendant on an airplane. So think about this, it begins with utility. The uh, flight attendant was trying to put a passenger's bag into an overhead compartment and had to take his jacket off to do so. So the, the initial epiphany had to do with the fit of the garment. And that uh, was what inspired him to start the, the company. Um, so they set out to reimagine the suit as both functional and chic. The, the pair met at FAT, Greg and Abdul met at FAT in 2006, and they graduated from the menswear program in 2008. Uh, Abbasi spent seven and a half years in the US Army before attending FAT, and afterwards he designed for the brand Engineered Garments and also managed their store in Soho. Rossboro designed for Ralph Lauren Purple Label. Um, the uh, Abbasi Rospero has won the Woolmark Prize, and this year they're up for the Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy Award, which is judged by somebody named Kylie Jenner. They may know who that is. I've heard of that person. Um, the, uh, that award will be announced in June, and they've been featured in the New York Times, Vogue, and this month in Time Out New York. So could you please join me in welcoming Abbasi Rospero. <laughs> Hey guys. Hey, thank you for having us. Thank you, thanks for coming. Um, why don't we start by talking about um, your vision for the suit. This is your suit, right, that you? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what was it that you um, saw that needed to be changed and that you did to change it? Yeah, so there was the, the air, uh, the flight attendant story that you that you mentioned, um, where this guy could not lift a bag above his shoulders, 
Um, there were some other things that influenced it too, though. We took the, in menswear design, we took the history of menswear class and uh, studied the suit. And, you know, in the class, you learned that it was first designed in about 1860 or 1870. And so when you hear that that's the case, and you look at the world around us and everything else that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis, architecture, automobiles, communications, everything, even the New York subway um, has evolved since then. And, uh, and how is it that this garment that's the gold standard of menswear that sits on our body has not evolved in 150 years? And so that was just a question that we had. And um, so then uh, Abdul and I started talking about how to evolve it forward. So, so what did you actually do to it? Like, if, if you we could, could we point out some of the details? It was a one, it's a one button suit, right? Yeah, that's actually version one. Um, so, <laughs> we could talk about this one or, or that yeah, one. Why not? Here, you, you annotate it. Okay, so um, basically, the way we, can you guys hear me? Hello, one, two, three. Okay, so the way we work is kind of like, you know, um, product designers, or industrial engineer. The, the true essence of a designer is to problem solve. So that was our first attempt. This is our third attempt. So basically what we did is we completely streamlined it once again. We turned all the guts inside out so that you could see all the piping details, all the chest canvassing. Instead of a one button stance, we actually put a, a concealed magnet. Um, we also put pockets for cell phone, metro cards, and things like that. We also have pockets on the side. Um, we did a streamlined sort of uh, lapel, so it, it mimics or kind of looks like a shawl lapel, but it's completely um, integrated into the, the chest. You can see all the guts on the inside, so it's a bit of deconstruction at work. Um, if Greg turns around, you can kind of see the back where we completely exposed all the details. So in the center back, we did like an inverted box pleat made out of rib fabric that stretches and moves when Greg moves. Also, we did a modified rag and sleeve, so this is taken from sports or military, and we integrate it into a blazer. So the idea is to have something that looks like your traditional blazer, completely streamlined and reductionist, and then works like your favorite cardigan or hoodie or anything like that. So this is version three, and as designers, we continue to innovate. So you'll see a version four and a five and a six until we perfected it, um, and that's how we operate. Okay. That's great. Well, I want one. It's like an infomercial. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, so what's a, can you tell me something about the LVMH award? What is this? Like, how did you find out about it? Did you have to? Did you have to submit a portfolio? Like. Um, well, LVMH is one of the largest luxury conglomerates on earth. It's Louis Vuitton, uh, Moet, and Hennessy. And about four years ago, they started this new prize to discover young designers. So um, we were, you know, a friend of ours told us that we should sort of apply. It was done via online, so it was very simple. We sent in lookbooks, we sent in um, our press. And yeah, within a few weeks, we got the call that we were one of the finalists. So they start with 1,200 applicants from around the world. They whittled it down to 21 from around the world. So we were one of the few American designers, New York-based um, menswear. And we went over there uh, about two weeks ago. And two days, we had about 45 industry professionals, including Kendall Jenner, who would look at our clothing. Um, and they would all select their top eight out of the 21 who would um, return to Paris in June for the final. The final would uh, consist of speaking to the Mount Rushworth fashion design. So you have Lagerfeld, Marc Jacobs, Phoebe Philo, you know, Ricardo Tichy, and you have 10 minutes in the room, they close the door, no cameras, no anything, and you pitch your idea, and the winner gets 300,000 euros in a one-year mentorship, so you should apply. You should, you should win this award. We need to get we this award, win, we need apply. to work it out. Um, Abdul, you have said a good design is invisible. You shouldn't notice it. Everything else is incorrectly designed. Could you, you know, unpack that a little bit? Just actually, just tell me, what's a good example of something that's incorrectly designed? Hmm. I mean, there's so many things. I don't know where to start. I mean, I think in essence, what I, what is it? Oh, flip phones, yeah, obviously. But the reason why I said that is because I think... Flip flip phones? Or well, I mean, the fact that we're all carrying an iPhone in our pocket or something that looks like an iPhone means that whatever preceded it was incorrectly designed, oh. right? So okay. um, in the notion of being reductionist, the iPhone exists as a rectangular obelisk that has multi-functions and it allows you to be your computer, it allows you to be your camera, your phone, all these sort of things. Um, so that is, that is a representation of good design. Bad design is when 
you notice that something doesn't work like it should, that it actually gets in the way of the function you're trying to perform. Okay. So I don't want to single anything out because I'm sure we've all experienced <laughs> it in our life. But um, when I meant good design is invisible, it means that when something works, you don't notice it. Okay. And with Abbasi Roswell, that's what we're trying to create. Not saying we're there yet, but the idea is to create something that completely vanishes from your body and allows your body to have a free range of motion and to work and do what God or Mother Nature or whoever intended it to do. Okay, so a lot of editing out. That's good. Um, Greg, um, you come across as kind of a, you, well, you both come across as scholars of menswear, and you, I think one of you, I actually don't know which one, told the New York Times something really fascinating about the buttons on the sleeve of a man's jacket, where they come from and why they're there. Could, would you mind telling everybody where they come from? That's kind of yeah, fascinating. Yeah, sure. So part of like our research when we were just coming up with this idea was like if we're going to deconstruct the menswear suit, we really need to understand where every deal, detail came from. Why is the sh suit, uh, shoulder a trapezoid shape? Why do you have buttons on the cuff? Um, why do you only button the top button and not the bottom button? There's all reasons for all of these that are sort of funny and historical. But the buttons on the cuff was an interesting one. Um, the, the story that we found was uh, a historical British naval story that um, I can't remember the, the sea captain's name off the top of my head, but basically uh, these British sailors would be out in the middle of the ocean, cold conditions, bad food, little sleep, and would be extremely homesick. And so there would be a lot of uh, sniffling and, and crying, actually. And so the admiral was not pleased with this because oftentimes they'd be wiping their, their noses on their sleeves. And so to, to deter that and remind them that they shouldn't be doing that, he would put gigantic gold buttons along the sleeve. And that was the initial sort of men's placket that became part of the uniform of the British Navy and then all you know militaries sort of followed suit behind the British because they were so influential. But that was the reason. Then it sort of got digested down um, uh, at the end of the 1800s into sort of a surgeon's placket, which had a little bit of functionality that you could sort of raise up your sleeve a couple inches. But um, yeah, that was the initial reason okay. that we had buttons on our cuff. Very fascinating social history for the next time that you're at a cocktail party. <laughs> okay, um, let's talk about Stern, New York. Um, uh, designer Austin Bjorkman, who graduated from FIT's menswear program in 2010, started Sir New York in 2011. And the original idea was to bring sportswear fabrication like mesh and neoprene and relaxed silhouettes into menswear. He's described the look as menswear for all genders and sold it in stores like Oak. Uh, this piece was actually sold at Oak. His more recent collections have comprised a novel mix of materials like baby alpaca, nylon rope, twine, and nylon fabric. And um, we are going to look at a minute of video from the, this collection, which was shown at the Brooklyn Museum. Thanks. All right, Austin, could you come up? Austin, thanks for coming. Um, so, so your first collections were in, were inspired by men's sportswear, right? Is that yeah, sort of very, very much so? Is this on? Yes. Now make sure you hold it right up to your mouth. There you go, really close. Otherwise, Got it. we'll get complaints. <laughs> 
So, you, so tell me, like, tell, how did this, like, where did this idea come from? How did it play out in the collections? Uh, when I first started Sir New York, um, everything at that time was very buttoned up, bow tie, dandy, um, very Tom Brown inspired. And I just wanted something, I wanted to kind of move away from that to be a little bit more relaxed and relatable in, you know, a little bit more of a, a dress up, dr dress down kind of way. So I started just playing with like combining different elements of different sports and putting that into fashion, like, and using um, mesh and neoprene. And at that time, like that stuff wasn't really being used. Mm. And I, it really just changed the whole direction of menswear. I think now we all see athleisure as like, the number one kind of mm. like a selling trend in the market. And um, I think that just really comes down to that it's it's very relatable. Yeah. We can we can all kind of we all grew up like playing sports mm. and like wanting that kind of like comfortable ease in a way that you can like dress it up or dress it down, mm -hmm. like I said. You, you're, now you're collaborating right now with Peloton, right? Peloton is a, Peloton is a, uh, it's like Soul Cycle, right? It's, it's yeah, a, it's kind of an upscale Soul Cycle where you can actually like purchase these bikes and do the classes from anywhere. And then you're uh, virtually taking the classes through a monitor. Um, so it's kind of like Soul Cycle, but the, and there is um, a studio here in the city um, so are you doing the the lines for them? Filmed. Are you doing clothes for them? Yeah, like, so now I'm actually doing active wear and actually like workout gear, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, I'm designing a line for them and it's mostly women's and it's meant to be, you know, very movable and active and it's kind of challenging because I've never worked with these like four-way stretch fabrics and um, c all the curves. Um, so it's actually really exciting and I'm looking forward to seeing it on people. Okay. Um, now, you, how did your your vision evolve a little bit when you you know you started to do this collection, which is maybe a little different with these knits, for example? Did so? How did did this vision change? Did your vision change a little bit, or? Yeah, um, I really wanted to kind of slow down fashion in my own world. Uh, I felt like um, everything is so mass produced and our my collections for Cerny York were getting bigger and bigger and more mass produced and I want to just slow that all down and get it back to like actually hands on making things. Um, and I took a Sawari weaving class which is this technique of weaving where they believe that uh, nothing is a mistake and that the, act, the flaws are actually like what makes things beautiful. And I was really inspired by that to like take that into hand knit, so it sort of meld the two together. And actually physically with my friend who you saw there who I collaborated with, we just spent the whole summer actually hand knitting and it was so cathartic and so fun and beautiful and just get back to that, like the craft of design. Great. Now, um, uh, Austin is trans. Um, and I'm very curious to know, uh, how does, how do you think being trans informs your interpretation of menswear? Well, the way I see it is like, um, it's an experience like growing up in Vermont and in Trinidad, like these two crazy, completely different places that obviously affect how I see the world and, and how I live my life. and being inspired by so many different things. And I think um, gender is just another one of those um, journeys as part of our, our life. So I can't say exactly like this led to this or that. It's just, as an artist, I think we're just inspired by everything around us and our experiences. Um, the one thing I will say is that I have a very deep knowledge of like how clothes can make you feel. Mm. Um, and how they can destroy your life as well. <laughs> like, oh. if you really don't feel comfortable in something, how that can really ruin your whole day or wow. your That's life, true. you know? And being That's forced true. to wear things that you would not choose ever to wear. Wow. So I think that kind of gives me um, an, an insight into clothing in a different way than a lot of people get to experience. That's great. 
Um, and I'd just like to point out one last thing, which is that uh, it's because of Austin that I know who Cakes to Killa is, because Cakes appeared in this show. And uh, if you don't know who Cakes to Killa is, you need to Google him and watch the Goody Goody video. Yeah, he's sassy. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> okay, Will thanks. Sheridan, also another uh, queer rapper, is also in that video. You should check him out, too. Great. All right, Andrew Morrison got his degree in production management here at FIT, class of 2006, and he calls his line genderless evening wear, genderless sportswear. Um, his namesake line debuted in 2015, and last year, Out Magazine chose him for its Fashion Vanguard Award. The line uses a lot of tuxedo elements, refined fabrics, refined silhouettes, high waists. And um, uh, Andrew uh, sent me a video to show, so I'm just gonna show, again, a one minute clip from the second video for this evening. Let's see if we can get that. <laughs> This queen since I was 17 Don't matter if I'm Prince Freed Or JB in them red high heels They still gon' get pictures of that hater Raid I'm like G. Louise You want a piece of me? I miss the hard work, no drama Make jokes but I love my mama Yes, I can't see the harm and speak in my mind If I wanna and with the man on my arm I'm still an exceptional charm Like you want a piece of me? I'm just a ballerino ignoramus I need to yeah. own my share that dreams is brainless I'm just yeah. a living in a life of sin I know he's too in Okay, great stuff Andrew Morrison, come up on stage Hey, Andrew. Hello. Hey, you're good. We're Hi. Good. Hey. Um, so you told Hugh that, quote, I get a lot of references to vampires and Star Wars. This actually kind of worries me a little bit. Uh, is this the future? Well, I, I definitely get a lot of, um, particularly it seems to be straight men for some reason that always point out Star Wars. I think it happens to be the, the fantasy element hmm. that kind of comes along with my collection, but um, it's certainly something that I'm inspired by. I don't know if it's the future of menswear, but I think fantasy is the future of menswear. I don't know about Star Wars. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, that also worries me for some reason. We need to talk about fantasies. Um, tell, me, tell me about your materials. Well, materials are really fascinating. Um, which, which materials inspire you and why? Well, I typically find myself using a lot of silk fabrics, whether it's a silk file or um, a heavy duchess satin. I like to use fabrics that are very kind of structured and almost unwearable to some mm. extent. I know that may sound a little bizarre, but I like to kind of test things out. So I, I spend quite a lot of time doing fabric research. I'm not really somebody that spends too much time sketching. I more so just kind of nail down what fabrics I want to use and then drape and kind of play around with Got them. it. This particular outfit is amazing. It will be dif difficult on the escalator, but it's terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Terrific. Um, so, I mean, in your opinion, you know, you're doing a genderless line and, and gender is a subtext for all menswear conversations. Do you think that you know, 300 years from now, are we even gonna have men's and women's wear? And do, you know, does it matter? It's a great question. I think that, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what will happen in 300 years from now, obviously, but I do, I hope that there's a difference because I don't, I think that masculinity is important. I think femininity is important. I think that they create a balance. Um, I would never want the industry to kind of become, or at least my collection, to become too much of one thing. I kind of go back and forth between the two. And like I think many of us know, gender is pretty much a, a sliding scale. I think that you kind of, everybody finds their 
place somewhere on that. Um, so I think that there will be, I think in the future people are hopefully gonna be dressing for their personalities mm. rather than anything else. Oh, I love that idea. This is really good. Okay, now we're gonna transition into part two where I'm gonna sit with them We'll just speak a little more generally about menswear. Um, so uh, you can all, we just take turns. Uh, what's what's the difference between doing uh, a menswear line and doing a women's wear line? Do you think? Maybe there's no difference. Are we just jumping in? Yeah, just I, jump in. Okay. Um, well, for me personally, I'm sure that it may be different for each of us, but I try and ignore whether I'm designing a man's garment or a woman's. I try more to think about who it is, forget about their gender, and just think about what it is that, that they want and their proportions. I think that that's the most important thing. I think historically, you could say men's has more pockets. Um, that's one thing we've heard. Uh, <laughs> men are always kind of a sucker for functionality, and, and women tend to, uh, just from you know what we've seen, they like more esoteric things that don't necessarily have to function perfectly. Um, but I think all those rules are of the past and are now being challenged and broken. But I think if you wanted to say, in, in school anyway, that was always, you know we had to have a lot of function in pockets and things like that in our garments. Um, so these are good. Um, how, uh, now I'm assuming that some of these people in the audience will be our students or who want to be where you guys are now. So how do you break in? Like how do you break into menswear specifically? If that's different from breaking in from womenswear, I don't know, maybe it's not. I mean, just breaking into the industry in general I think is a challenge in itself, but I would recommend interning. I think for me, I, I jumped into this industry because I was going to FIT, I had to take an internship for my associate's degree. Um, that internship turned into a full-time position, and it kind of just was a, uh, I'd never really looked back. It kind of just went in from one position to another with various brands, um, you know, been laid off a thousand times from various companies, starting and then going out of business. So you just want to get in, and you want to be that intern that's there 15 minutes early. And if you can be the last to leave, I think that's fantastic. Uh, you certainly will you know, you'll, you'll stick out, and I think that's important. Let's get any other, other advice? Personally, I think there's no one trajectory, one path. I think there's so many different ways to do your own thing, be your own person, um, and work within and around the industry. I mean, that it is a very traditional path, and yes, you should intern. Absolutely, you'll learn way more interning most of the time, for, especially for a small designer, um, than you would in, you know, in any other way, um, because you'll be asked to do so many different things and shown so many different things that you didn't even realize. Like, I'm sure we all wear so many hats and do so many different things that you have to just like be willing to jump in and do whatever you can. But that being said, I think you can also follow your own path in whichever way you want to and find your way to um, creating good, design and um, maybe a brand even. Okay. Now all of these lines are made in New York, right? You're all making in New York. Um, maybe one of you could tell me a really, really short, like five sentence story uh, about something either good or bad related to how, what, what that's like. Since so much now is outsourced. What is it? What is it? You can stop by the fabric or the uh, the factory on your way to lunch or on the way home. I mean, that's I think the best thing for us is uh, we're in the factory five times a week, um, every every day, and so you you know everything that's going on. You can oversee your sampling and your production, and um, you know your hands are in the product from start to finish, which I think is really important about getting uh, your vision out into the world is having product that you stand for, and you know you, you stand for it if you've seen it every day of its creation. Yeah, that is very true. I mean, being able to have everything that you can source right at your fingertips is incredible and cuts down a lot of, like, time, waiting time for, you know, overseas sort of things. And I think it's really great to be actually 
um, support this, the industry in our city and in the U.S. So I think it's really important to manufacture here as much as you can. I, re I remember one time I was interviewing Nanette Lepore, and she was just she wasn't even talking to me. She was saying she was just expressing anguish because a button store was closing, and I was sort of like, "Why is that a big deal?" She said, "Don't you understand? That's the best button store in New York." And she, she, you know, she could go and she could get exactly the button that she wanted. She could match the button that she had one of, you know. So it was kind of great for her. Um, but this is good. Um, uh, so let me ask you this. Now, uh, Pre President Trump has um, has said no, no. Uh, so President Trump has said, and his administration has said that they want to bring. Uh, manufacturing back to the United States, and they want to do this through a series of tariffs and other financial incentives for uh, many industries. And, and I was wondering uh, how you felt about, I mean, let's set the rest of the stuff aside, if we can, uh, the rest of the Trump uh, uh, agenda aside. But, but this particular one, is this going to be good for our industry, do you think? If you know, yes or no, or what? I don't think a lot of people realize how expensive it already is to manufacture in New York. And, you know, there's a lot of things that I don't agree with Trump on. I mean, there's there's a few areas that I can kind of find a, you know, a position to kind of, I guess, somewhat agree. But I, anything to bring production back to New York, it's fantastic. But adding a 32 or 35 percent tax on top of what we're already paying, I mean, all you're going to do is see your retail prices going up. All the retail prices will go up. Designers that are working with Asia are going to increase their prices before we do. But in the end, it's going to make production in New York be more expensive as well. But a lot of people also don't realize that you're paying duties to import your fabric as well as your garments. So there's already so many costs that make it nearly impossible to make a profit. So I don't really know how much more that's going to help. It, thoughts? I was going to say, this is interesting. The whole argument is reframed because as of, uh, what, three months ago, we, we, you know, pound our chest and say, made in New York, made in USA, and we were very proud of it. We went to Paris this last time. We said, made in New York, made in USA, and they're like, oh, is that because of your president? And, and of course, that was never the intention, but now it's suddenly like, well, is that a nationalistic view? Is this a conservative view? No, it's like, well, we just happen to live there, and we're companies based there, so that's where we make everything. But um, it's interesting that the whole context around the question is reframed now. I can see why. Yeah. Okay, other thoughts on that? Anything else? Okay. I was going to add one thing about the yeah. garment district since we yeah. kind of skipped over it, but the frustrating thing about the garment district, I think that we all know being students here and everything, is like most other aspects of life, you can use uh, Google Maps or Yelp to find things, and the gar gar garment district is like this anomaly where none of those rules apply, and you might be able to find mood fabrics, but everything else is TBD. Like, you, you can't tell where good manufacturing is based on Yelp or Google Maps or good button stores. You sort of just have to allow your, like, get into the garment district and allow yourself to just sort of discover things and meet people, and, and, and it's, it's sort of old-fashioned that way, that networking and connections is the way things happen there, not through um, any kind of technology or anything that would make logical sense. So it's, it's old school. Very old saying. school. Wow. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that is sort of what I've heard, actually. Um, so um, what, can we talk about trends for a second? Like, what's a menswear trend? that you uh, adore, like that you're really into right now? Well, no, nothing. Uh, <laughs> like, we like nothing about menswear at all. I we just want to that, uh, For me personally, I'm, you know, I'm really inspired by oversized shapes and um, a lot of men's shirting comes up within my collection a lot, whether I take a, a shirting group that I'm designing and cut it into a different fabric. I just, I really like work, working with um, kind of, I guess, fab, you know, like I mentioned, structured fabrics and whatnot. But um, for me, a huge trend is just oversized, 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 oversized. I think that, the, I mean, obviously, again, it comes back to proportion, so you have to know who you're designing for, but that's one of my favorites. Um, similarly, and it kind of goes back to your question about the difference between men's and women's wear, and I think the trend that I'm most excited about is seeing men um, experiment with volume and shape and um, draping, and men's wear is so structured usually and um, uh, refined 
in such a way that like details become like almost unnoticeable. Um, and I think that the trend right now is to allow men to be a lot more freer in the shapes and sizes and the, the drape and the flow. So I'm excited about that too. I think maybe the like overarching theme is the trends are fracturing so much. There isn't one underlying trend anymore, which I think is really amazing. Like the fact that all three of us are sitting up here and, and doing our own thing, none of which are really related in any, any way, shape or form is pretty interesting. And I think um, maybe 10 years ago, there seemed to seem to be this Americana nostalgic heritage thing that was going on, which I think a lot of us designers are saying, well, we need to just stop looking at the past so much and ref being so referential. There's plenty of new ideas we can come up with to push things forward. Um, but anyway, there is no trend at the moment. You, you can find guys who are still into you know, very fitted Italian suiting. You can find guys that are doing the very dark avant-garde leather things and, and everything in between. I think that's what's really amazing is um, there's room in the world for all these trends and ideas. Can, can, we, re can we retire the word trend though? Okay, what, we, what should we call it? No, I think, I think trends are, are basically constructs that lead a bunch of people that don't have any ideas to one direction. I think that a true designer is directional and creates their own lane. So whenever I hear questions about what is trending, I'm just sitting here bubbling up like, do, you, do your thing, like who cares? Like somebody had to do something first and then everyone jumped in and was like, oh, I like that trend. No, you don't. You don't know what you were thinking of and you saw that and everyone else said it was cool, so then you jumped on board. So, so I think, um, especially like he was saying about the fracturing of, of trends and, and the, you know social media making everything so transparent. I think. It, we should just be doing our thing. Like it's 2017, like everybody should have their own trend. Each individual person should look exactly who they're supposed to look like. Not like whoever, you know, in Paris or whatever trend guy tells them they should look. I think that individuality should be the trend. That's what I think. Sorry. Preach, That's preach, right yes. there. That's really great. So I was gonna ask you what trends you didn't like, so maybe the trend you don't like is trend. Exactly. <laughs> right? You got it. Okay. Um, oh, That's this just is me. This okay. has a visual. Hold on. Very true. <laughs> I was gonna ask. Oh, uh, who's a who's an icon for today? I just randomly grabbed Kendrick Lamar, uh, that Canadian fellow on the right there, and. Um, <laughs> Do you know that guy? Everybody knows who that is. And um, that's, this is the cover of Original Plumbing, which is a uh, magazine for people who've transitioned from female to male. It's a really great magazine, by the way. Who's, a, who's an icon now that we're interested See, in? For me, I'm very inspired by all sorts of different creative people. So I, you know, anybody from like the obvious, well, I guess slightly more obvious, like the ASAP Rockies and um, like you mentioned, Ken Kendrick Lamar. Um, for me, it's kind of just about what that person's doing. So whether it's a rapper or a dancer, like James Whiteside, who was in the video that was played earlier, um, those to me are icons. People that have made it to somewhere by working really hard and by also being creative. Um, so I think that kind of... Yeah. It's who they are, not what, not what they're wearing right, necessarily. Yeah. That's true for everybody, no one's gonna... I'd say um, in the photo, picture world we live in of Instagram and Facebook and everything else that each of us or all of us are, are an icon in a way or, or um, because I think never before have people been so ready for photos, you know? I think you kind of expect to go out and if you're with your friends, a photo will be taken and so you kind of have to become your own icon and obviously with the rise of uh, selfies, I think, you know, also it's kind of you're turning into your own icon. So I think that also speaks to Abdul's um, thought about individuality is uh, I think people are owning their own ideas more. And so in some ways we're all, all an icon. This is great. And this is a good time since we're talking about, in a way, you. Maybe we can now turn the spotlight on to you and ask you if you have questions for any of the designers for the next 15 minutes. Anyone? I can't see anything. So. Oh. Somebody in the middle. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, okay. Oh, thanks. Uh, the question I have is, how do you decide on the ideas that you're going to work on? Do you toss a coin? Do you rock, paper, scissors? How do you make the decisions if you guys work together? <laughs> Just rock, paper, scissors. You got it on the head right there. Oh, make sure you wrestle. speak into the... Uh, Greg, make sure you speak into sorry. the mic, uh, otherwise we will get complaints. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
we should we flip a coin to answer the question? Or no? <laughs> yeah, that's a. I'd say uh, so. We um, had a discussion four or five years back about how you know how we're going to decide what to design this season, and it's kind of intimidating because up until your first collection as a business, you, your best probably work that you've done was in school doing a collection or something. But anyway, um, we both talked about let's let's design by what we're having an emotional response to. Um, so be that uh, art, a location, um, something political, we, we are basically guided by what we're feeling. Um, and so that can come out in a variety of ways. So for the uh, Fall 17 collection that'll come out in July. Um, we were designing that this past fall, and so all that we were thinking about, I think everybody in America was thinking about, was this election because it was, you know, back and forth. We were watching the debates. We were getting together with um, Abdul's wife and my girlfriend and, and sitting there, and we were all just disgusted by the whole thing because, you know, so much talk about immigrants and everything else. So that was on our mind. And, um, so we started thinking about, uh, just to give you an example really quick, we started thinking about how can we take this, this kind of anguish that we're feeling about the election and turn that into an idea. And so what that evolved into was we kept seeing these images um, uh, of um, you know, the riot police who were tactically decked out and they had glass masks and, and all this armor. And then you'd see these protesters who were in t-shirts and jeans or sweaters and were not protected at all. And so we started thinking about how can we sort of, um, uh, how can we uniform these protesters to feel strong and empowered um, and that they can stand up against the forces that be. And so that became the idea for Fall 17. So the collection was called Dissident. Um, and that was the thinking. But in, in the past, it's been art or, uh, or travels or different things that have this, influenced it. This, uh, this photo, these photos that you produced uh, got noticed. I mean, I think Vogue, didn't Vogue write about these pictures? That these were soon after the election. You you did some we, right before actually. Yeah, we we went to Washington D.C. Um, about ten days before the election. Uh, we drove down there um, with Ali, our model, who's here tonight, and my little brother lives down there. But Ali and Abdul are both from that area, so we just uh, we went down. Um, we got up at about uh, six thirty in the morning, and we're shooting at all the monuments around D.C. Um, by probably seven thirty or so. And it, it was fun because no one shoots fashion shoots in Washington, D.C., um, but all the tourists that were there were just watching it and you know going crazy that this was happening. But anyway, the point was to show, we had talked about um, what's our theme. We're not just gonna go there and shoot against the buildings, but we were talking about the five stages of grieving. And so we used that as a, a guide of the emotions when we were shooting the. That it was very powerful, actually, uh, even though the, they weren't sort of, they were political, uh, in spirit, although they weren't sort of literally political, so it was sort of fascinating, actually. It wasn't it wasn't taking a side either way. It was just right. saying that we were disappointed with our country at that stage. Mm. Okay, um, I'm gonna read some. Uh, let's see it. Oh, at what age did you realize that this is what you wanted to do, and what convinced you to pursue it? Is that for anybody in particular? I'm um, just for the war, for the room, for you guys. At what age? Yeah, when. You know, I didn't even know that I wanted to get into fashion before I was accepted to FIT. I had nothing, I had no prior knowledge of fashion. I wasn't really interested in it. It was very bizarre. I don't know how it worked out. Um, but I basically, to be completely honest, I was late at applying to colleges. It was not something I was excited about. Um, I wanted, I was looking into the Fashion Institute and I wanted to understand the, the background of the apparel business and how it worked. Uh, and that kind of, and that was at 17. So if that answers the question, but then it just, like I said earlier, kind of snowballed into a career, which in hindsight, I think is pretty fascinating. But while it was happening, you know, it wasn't something that I was really paying attention to. What about the rest of you? Austin, when did I you know? I started out just like being an avid thrifter and trying to like make things fit me. I'm sort of self-taught sewing because um, men's clothes just did not fit me off the rack. And I wanted to look and feel good. So I just taught myself how to use the sewing machine. Um, 
And then another non-traditional path, I actually started working at a leather company in San Francisco and um, making latex clothing and in my spare time teaching myself how to use the industrial machines there, got really good at it and started making all the like deprivation hoods and bondage suits and just all of this like crazy stuff, which then started me thinking about, oh, I actually want to like make clothes for myself now that I know how to put things together. So I started studying, and whenever you study fashion, generally it's usually women's wear. We know there's only a couple of um, colleges in the states that actually teach a men's wear program. And so it was really just like my own making, kind of like wanting things to fit myself that started me really on the path of being a fashion designer. I was not into fashion as a thing at all. I wasn't interested in the industry or anything. I just wanted to like fit myself and eventually that. Were you still in your way. teens when you sort of? No, I was in my early 20s. In your 20s, yeah. okay. Yeah. Abbasi Rasbro, well, just how old were you? 22 and a half. 22 <laughs> and a half. Oh, okay. Um, so this is an interesting question uh, and I'm gonna precede it by saying that I'm never gonna wear camouflage. I'm just not doing it. But somebody asked, what do you find interesting about the military? Or do you? Maybe you don't. I don't... Is that directed towards me? Or... It could be. Because I was in the military. You, you kind of were, bio. so, you know. Um, I mean, the military is the epitome of masculinity. You know, that's a loaded word. But I think um, it's the modern day warrior. It's the protector, it's the savior. So when, um, you know, when soldiers come back home, you know, all the women want them, everyone, you know, they get the best jobs, X, Y, and Z. So I think that uniform becomes a, a symbol of that. And I think that's why people gravitate towards military clothing, war type clothing, um, camouflage as well. Um, it's, you know. I would, I would wear a tailor, I'm, you know, I'm not I'm But not, you know you're wearing you know. camouflage right now, actually. And is this count as This camo? is New York City this camouflage. Oh, it's New York camouflage. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, oh, no, I, we wear so a uniform in this city. we're all wearing black clothes. And, I just point this out. You know, it's the urban camouflage, so anyway. Yeah, point taken. Um, the um, two people have written, what's your best advice for a student? I think some of it, some of this we got already, but maybe someone else has something besides the internship. Response. Um, I would say learn everything and then unlearn it. Meaning that once you get out of school, you need to teach yourself. So self-initiated projects, figuring out why things work rather than what someone told you. I think in menswear, um, and I can speak for myself, we were overloaded with projects, deadlines. We just had to sew things up. You didn't really understand what you were doing. And those years that I left school, that's when I really deconstructed the idea of why does the sleeve go in like this, or why do we have to make patterns this way? So I think once you learn it, the rules, you can break them, and that's when you create your own identity. So um, whatever you're doing here, soak it up, but as soon as you get out, like start figuring it out your, on your own, I would say. That's good. I would also say that while you're at school, it's the time to be as wild and creative as possible. Because you really, after that, if you're going to work for someone or start your own brand, you will not be able to do that. You will need things to be marketable, relatable, and wearable. So push it as far as you can now, because that will then instruct you later to be able to actually pare it all down. So go crazy now. Do everything you'd want to do. I would also like to say that I think that it's important just to kind of ignore the whole you know, what we've been talking about, menswear and womenswear, I think as a designer, you can be a designer and not claim one of those. You don't have to be a menswear designer or a womenswear designer. I think you should just ignore that and focus on the garment that you want to make and hopefully there will be somebody that wants to wear that. Um, so, someone actually, uh, I want you to hear your, what you have to say, but then someone has a sort of a follow-up question that responds to that. So. Why don't you say what you were going to say, and then I'll follow up with, with Andrew. Well, I'll give um, practical advice and then uh, kind of non-practical advice. So the practical advice I'd say is when you're a student, get an internship, as we did say. And the three things are like work very hard, as we've all said. You need to communicate well and come in to your internship every day with like a positive, enthusiastic attitude because they're not going to hire you if you come in with a bad attitude. So whatever you have to do to get yourself up before your internship, be that. Um, but the kind of not so uh, pragmatic um, advice would be, and I think you can see by all of everybody sitting up here, 
is you have to figure out who you are and what you want to say, and that is the best way to break into the industry. Um, because when you're in school, I think a lot of the time you're designing based on who your favorite designers are. You're sort of maybe looking to see what they're doing and uh, interpreting it slightly differently or in your own way. But when you start to get out of school and you start to really, I think, have time to think for yourself and a little bit of space, you start to figure out what exactly am I trying to say? What's my backstory? What are my influences? Who am I authentically deep down? And I think that starts to come out and that's how you break into the industry is, is having a voice that's your own and not, you know, you can't do uh, Rick Owens or Mark Jacobs part two. They're already doing it way better than you're ever going to do it. You have to be yourself um, on 10 and that will stand, that will stand for something and it'll be good enough. That's good. Um, uh, Andrew, I did want to follow up with you. This, per this person is asking, do you think with gender fluidity becoming more and more prevalent, men's wear borrowing from women's and vice versa, do you think, I hear an agenda in this question, see if you hear it. Do you think fashion school curriculums should reflect this change? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, why not? Yeah. Why yeah. How would I they? I mean, is that, is that hard well, to I do? Don't, I don't, to I don't be make completely honest, I don't know what this, uh, I don't know what FIT's fashion curriculum is right now, but. Um, I think that it should certainly change to meet the times that we're in, yeah, why not? That would, I would think it would be silly if it wasn't, if it didn't work that way. You know, in a way, you, uh, this is interesting, maybe transition, I thought someone would ask this question, so I'm gonna ask it for you. Your, your degree was in production management, so did you sort of sidestep the question of well, men's wear versus women's wear, or how did that? I don't that... know if, uh, sorry to cut you off, no, I don't know if I've me. mentioned this yet, but basically when I, when I was in FIT doing my production management degree, I had to get an internship. That internship turned into a f nearly a full decade of working for women's wear brands. Um, I started designing because I got laid off time after, I think within five years, I was probably laid off four, four or five times. Um, and as many people know, I'm sure that, you know, you don't work, f if you have a job within fashion and you're there for, you know, two, three, four, five years, that's a pretty lengthy amount of time. It's pretty sad that that's the case, but I think that, um, you know, for me, I just started designing because I wanted to make products for myself, and then it kind of snowballed into a collection. Um, I'm not exactly sure what your original question was, but I hope I answered it. Well, you, you, <laughs> you have a production management degree, and maybe that's you know, advantageous in a way, because can you go into the factory and say, you know, or whatever, or however, and, you know, sort of manage how the thing is made, and is right. it easier than if you just, if you, I don't want to say just have a design degree, because that's a different, it's just a different set of skills, but do you feel that it in some way is helpful in, in a different way? It absolutely is helpful. I, production, product development and production are some of the most grueling processes within fashion. Um, design is obviously certainly difficult. It's something that you have to really think about what, you know, what you're doing. You have to have a clear vision. Um, but within production, you have a very short amount of time. Even if you're, you know, even if you have a four or five, six month window to ship, it is very difficult to manufacture multiple pieces. So if you have one garment, I mean, typically within my collection alone, I could pull something off of my collection and make two, three, four pieces if I wanted to and I, and I needed to, I could manufacture 500 um, with the right amount of time, of course, but it's certainly something that helps to have that background. I think at some point, I, I would hope to think that at some point each designer would spend time understanding that process, and I think the majority of them do. A lot of them don't really like to spend too much time involved in that because it's it's not glamorous at all. It's actually pretty horrible, to be completely honest. And this is uh, not to kind of uh, you know deter any of you from wanting to do this, but production is it's pretty gross. You know, it's it's not something that I ever would like to do again. I am doing it now for myself, so it's a little bit of a different story. But um, you know, wait, wait, there's just it, so many issues that come up. Why is you can't it gross? Avoid that, what do you mean? Because you you, like, well, that's a it's a dramatic way of saying it, I think, but. First of all, it depends if you're manufacturing overseas, if you're manufacturing in New York. They have their own set of issues, um, but it, there's just so many moving parts. There's so many things that you can't control, even if you try your best to control every single thing. I don't care if you are the you know, biggest control freak out there, and I think that some people might say that I'm probably 
you know, to some extent <laughs> controlling, but you cannot handle everything. You ca it's very difficult to ship, you know, each delivery on time. And at the end of the day, the department stores or the, the retailers that are accepting the merchandise, they don't have to take responsibility for anything. If you're late, they will hand it back to you. So it's, it's very difficult to kind of wrap your head around that to begin with. And then to be good at it is a whole other thing. This is fascinating. I want to follow up with the designers for a second and just one follow-up question, and we'll do one more question, and then we'll be done. But my question is, um, you know, frequently, I, I must have interviewed, in the years I've been at FAT, I must have interviewed 500 designers. And often the designers will say to me, and this is something you are not saying, but I'm interested to hear if you agree with this, that the thing that they needed to have was the person who did the business side of it, not just the design. Did you find that to be the case? Absolutely. I think yeah. that they're like, we wear so many hats, like doing production, learning the business, being a designer. If you are studying design, you want to be a designer, you're only thinking about that and you're thinking about the designs you want to do. In the end, it's really 5% of what our jobs really are. And um, I think that it's, the more you know in all of these different areas, the more you can try to like acquaint yourself as much as possible, then you'll have a better time being able to handle all of these things. I mean, we're all learning as we go along. And are, am I right here? Like all of us are Absolutely. learning as we go. And it's so easy to make so many mistakes. And the thing is that we're doing it publicly, you know, like everyone can see those mistakes right away because um, that's the nature of our brand and, you know, it's all visual. So the more you know, I think, and the better rounder experience that you can find yourself in, you'll have a better time. It's like, that's all I can really say about that, I guess. That's great. Uh, last question. Uh, who is your favorite designer? <laughs> Mother Nature. Anybody else? Well, for me, I, I, just to name a few because I couldn't really name one of them. I mean, I am a huge fan of um, Hader Ackerman is an amazing designer to me, and Demula Meester. Um, De and Demula Meester. Okay, sorry, I couldn't hear. And Demula Meester, yeah. I think for some reason, I don't know why, but a lot of amazing designers for me come out of Eastern Europe. Um, so that's just to name a few, oh, yeah. That's good. I don't really like naming names, honestly. Oh, okay. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci. He's a very nice. Uh, I, I liked his um, spring collection. Uh, <laughs> 13, 7, whatever. I was going to say, this is tying back into earlier, but I think the military is the, is the most inspiring or my favorite designer. And the reason being is everything that they do has staying power. Um, you think about uh, menswear, which is what we're talking about here. Every archetype of menswear is derived from a military garment, every, every garment, the bomber jacket, the trench coat, the suit, uh, the t-shirt, sweatshirt, sweatpants, pea coats. Um, every single piece in the men's wardrobe is a military derivative. And the reason was because it was designed for um, function whenever it was originally designed by the military. They were thinking about saving lives or the that, that's the intention of the garment, and that has um, resonance across time. And I think that's, um, I think it's the most influential designer to every designer, menswear designer out there. And I think it's, um, but it's, it's an interesting perspective, and that's my favorite. And there's no, they're, they're almost never named. Right, you don't. Yeah, think I think like, it's oh, nameless. They're usually nameless. And it's not necessarily even American military. It's British military, or right. it's you know oh. Peruvian military, or uh, Bangladeshi military. I don't know, but you know they're all designing. They're designers, whoever they are, designing with keeping these guys alive within specific climates Fantastic. and war zones and everything else. Fantastic. All right, guys, thank you so much. Thank Can you. you give a round of applause to them? Thank you. Thanks so much.